pray together this morning. Lord, as we bask in the glory of the resurrection, may we be reminded once again in worship that we are to be a resurrection people each and every day. May Christ's resurrection be our place of hope, our well of joy, as we gather with other believers and singing and praying and opening ourselves to your word. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning and welcome to First Baptist. We are so glad to see you on this sunny day. Today is your first time with us. Please know you are our honored guest and we are so glad that you are here. We invite you to fill out a guest card located in the pew in front of you, place it in the offering plate later in the service. And as you go, find a folder that looks like this. So each of the exits has some more information about the ministry and missions here at First Baptist. Feel free to take some time and look through your bulletin of the many ways that you can connect and serve. Our Wednesday night dinner will return this week, week from a spring break last week. We look forward to seeing you then. If you would like to volunteer or you know anyone who would be interested in being a part of our ESL or citizenship ministry, this is a meaningful thing that happens on Wednesday night. Like I said, if you'd like to volunteer or you know someone who could use our ESL or citizenship ministry classes, I hope you'll give this to them. Let us continue and worship with one another this day. known hymn in Christianity not found in the Bible. For centuries in Jerusalem, a candle was kept perpetually burning in the empty tomb of Christ. Its glow, a symbol of the living light of Jesus. At dusk, his followers sang this song as a new candle was lit and brought forth from the tomb. Its bright, solitary flame calling the church to celebrate the risen Lord as we do now. Son of God is our light for all the 
Son of God is alive, for all the world doth glorify Thee, O gladsome light, for all the world doth glorify Thee. pray with me. Oh, great God, what a wonderful thing to be quiet and to listen to the beauty of the harmonies of this music, to come together as a church body, that we may remind each other of our love for one another in our need for your grace and your wisdom and your truth. I pray, God, that you would encourage all those who are in the midst of discouraging circumstances. I thank you that we are still connected with so many who cannot get here physically but who are watching now and we pray for their healing and for their encouragement and that they would know how very special they are to you and to us. And we thank you that this last week has been a bit of a break for so many. We thank you for the many ways that you are encouraging us in this difficult world. So often it is frightening to even turn on the TV to find out the latest calamities. And I just want to thank you, God, for the way that many of us have been encouraged to watch these women playing basketball and the way they are celebrating their teams and each other and teaching us to look beyond our own teams and our own tribes and to celebrate hard work and teamwork and the things that we have in common. I pray, God, that you would help each one of us that are serving around the world. Uh, we think of Luke and the work that he is doing for the people of Ukraine and ask that you would strengthen him and encourage him and um, just give him your loving spirit of power and serving. And for all of those that we have supported with the Global Mission Offering, I pray for their strength and their efficacy as they spread your truth and your love and your grace. And so we pray that you would continue to call us to greater things than just our own personal interest. And we join with those all around the world as we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our staff. Thank you for the members. Thank you for the people that volunteer in this community that are helping throughout the world. Help us support them in our ties, our time, our love, and our prayers. God, during these turbulent times, we ask for peace. We ask for love. We ask for understanding with each other. We ask for opportunities for wisdom and guidance. We ask to help us appreciate the time. We, help us, we ask for calmness. Help us learn how to not to worry. Help us learn how to have faith. Help us learn to trust each other. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve and come together in an organization and a church such as this, which is excited about bringing a group of people together and a common goals, not all common beliefs, but in common goals and common understanding and love. And we thank you so much for that spirit of love. Help us support, help us look for ways to support. And thank you for those blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. So a number of us were on spring break this past week. I think some of us are still on spring break by the looks of things, and that's okay. I actually took spring break also uh, this past week. So you know what that means? It's time to go back to school and to work tomorrow. But you know what? Sometimes I remember when I, when I would take spring break, it always helped me remember that summertime was pretty close, and that we only had a couple of months of school left. So maybe this spring break will make you think a little bit more, hey, summer's just around the corner, and that's pretty exciting. I think also sometimes when we live this life, what we, what we do with our lives points people to the hope of heaven, and it helps people understand that the resurrection and Christ's return and the hope of all things being redeemed and reconciled is just around the corner, not too far down the road. So I want you guys, as you go back to school this week and you go back to your sports and doing all of those things, I want you to live like Jesus in your life, to do the things that Jesus teaches, to do the things that Jesus does in his life so that people can have the hope of heaven. Does that sound good? Let's pray together and then we will head to Children's Church. Lord, we thank you so much for this day where we continue to reflect on and think about Easter and all it means for us. Today, we are thankful for the hope of heaven, the hope of resurrection, and we pray that we would tell others about the hope of Jesus through our words and through our actions. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Church, I'd like to invite you to turn to today's focus passage, which is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 23, if you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or device. And so once again, our focus passage is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 23. These words are also printed in your bulletin, if you'd like to follow along there. To the church at Ephesus, Paul writes... In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the work of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jim Collins wrote one of the top leadership books ever written. If you've taken a leadership course in school, or maybe you've shared this in your own organization. It's called Good to Great. And one of the points that he makes, or one of the the terms that he coins in this book is something called the Stockdale Paradox. In a nutshell, this is a philosophy of the importance of confronting brutal realities within your organization and facing the cold, hard facts before you can move forward. So First Baptist Church, let me lay out a few things about us. No, I'm just kidding. We're not, we're not going there today. Uh, we are going to talk about what he said. And he talked about how laying out those cold, hard facts came from someone named Admiral Jim Stockdale. Now, some of you might remember him as Ross Perot's running mate 30 years ago, if you can believe that. But the main thrust of his career was that he was a Medal of Honor recipient and the highest-ranking United States military officer who was a prisoner of war in the Hanoi Hilton. And so Jim Collins, in in writing his book, wanted to to talk to Admiral Stockdale about his experience there and ultimately what led him through that difficult time and what was going through his heart and mind as he was waiting uh, to get out of that prisoner of war camp. So eventually, when Collins was able to land this interview. He read his memoir before talking to him, wanted to know a little bit more about Admiral Stockdale, and and he says, quite frankly, I became depressed just to read about the conditions that he was in and the ways that he was treated. Uh, And so he finally got to ask him. He he, he was able to meet with him, and he asked questions like, how did you do it? How were you able to get through that? How, How did you deal with that? And Admiral Stockdale said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. He said, I never doubted that not only would I get out, but that I would also prevail in the end. So stunned by the Admiral's answer, Jim Collins took a few moments to think about what he said and to think about how he was able to make it through those terrible times. But he couldn't also help but ask another question. He, he said, do you remember the ones that didn't make it out? Do you remember who didn't make it out? What was it about them? Why, why couldn't they make it. And and without missing a beat, the admiral said, oh, that's easy. They were the optimists. The the optimists were the ones who who couldn't make it out. I mean, you, you just said that you never lost sight of the end of the story. 
The Admiral, well, the Admiral noticed Collins' confusion and said, the optimists, oh, they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And they'd say, oh, we're going to be out by Easter. And then Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving and then Christmas and then Easter again. And he, he goes on to say they would die of a broken heart. You see, I think there is a lesson in Admiral Stockdale's framing of reality that we can carry with us as people of faith who place our hope in the resurrection. And we need to ask ourselves today, on this second Sunday of Easter, are we simply optimistic or are we grounded in hope? We're going to parse those words because there is a difference there. Are, are we optimistic or are we full of hope? Last week, we spoke about the resurrection. We, we spoke of it. We, we sung of it. We, we prayed about it. And like Admiral Stockdale did while a prisoner of war, we held on to and celebrated the prevailing victory of Christ that was seen in the empty tomb. And we proclaimed Jesus is alive and that a new era of creation is upon us an era of new life, new creation, recreation, and that the hope of heaven lives in our hearts and our minds and is being proclaimed and spread throughout the world. So what do we do when our current reality doesn't line up with the hope which we live for? What do we do when optimism won't save us? Today we're continuing on on that Easter story, but we're going to jump to Paul's epistle to the church at Ephesus, a letter speaking of Christ's power to unify and empower the church. This is a true prison epistle. Paul is writing today's letter. Today's scripture was written in the midst of prison. Paul is arguably not optimistic about his future. Paul is not optimistic. Paul really never mentions optimism, but he does talk a lot about hope. Paul talks a lot about hope which is present because of Christ's work and because of the resurrection. Paul says we've received something that is valuable, that we need to hold on to, that has been given to us, that we must also share about and proclaim. He says we've received an inheritance, something of value that has been entrusted to us. We've received the gospel that has been handed down to us, and it must be proclaimed through our lifestyle of hope. He said, we are destined to share this resurrection hope. We were chosen to share this hope. So Paul is already saying, there's something beyond me in this prison. There's something even beyond you in that church at Ephesus that we need to live for and proclaim. God's Spirit helps us fulfill that destiny of proclaiming the hope of Christ. And so Paul in verse 15 says, I, I know you're doing that. Paul offers a compliment to the church at Ephesus. He says, I know you're doing this. Your faith, your love, it's, an, it's evident that you love Jesus, and I, and I give thanks for you. But he says, I'm going to continue to pray for you that you might receive more wisdom, that you might grow in this faith, that you might perceive what is the hope to which Christ has called you. There's that central word and concept of Paul's letter again. Hope. Optimism is not mentioned once. Paul is not imparting some kind of toxic positivity on his own situation or others. By all accounts, this was a fledgling church, a flailing church. They may not have had much reason to be optimistic. Paul may not have had much reason to be optimistic as he spent time in a prison. But Paul is saying we live by a different outlook than optimism. We live by hope. And hope is given to us because of the resurrection of Christ. Our stories are joined together as we await the fulfillment of Christ's work. Paul says we need to gain wisdom in this area, in this arena. As we learn more about resurrection, as we come to embrace the reality of resurrection, we need to grow in wisdom. I think this is actually kind of a surprising saying of Paul, something that took me a little bit off guard, because I know that the more I learn in this life, it's, it's possible to become more pessimistic and less optimistic, isn't it? 
aren't there those times where you say you, you, you've learned more, you see more, you read more, and it feels like you become less hopeful over time? But, but Paul says it's different for followers of Christ. With wisdom comes more hope. Because we, with wisdom, we look for and notice and see the signs of resurrection in the world around us, even where our circumstances are brutally difficult to face. You better believe that Paul's current circumstances were brutally difficult for him to face. And Paul says in verse 19, that's why we have power. He implies that we have power to do something, to redeem the circumstances, because we live by a resurrection hope. And we can live resurrection in real time, and there, there is power in that. Yes, we have the hope of the final resurrection, of the time where Christ will return to redeem all things, and there will be a great resurrection for those who place their faith, hope, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul says we can live out that hope even now. And so today's scripture reminds us that Christ is bringing all things to an end and that even where life seems pessimistic, you better believe it, resurrection is here and it is active today. I'll confess to you, I had a great Easter. Seven days ago, we had a wonderful, we had three wonderful worship services here at First Baptist Church. We had an awesome baptism of Adeline Van Landingham at the beginning of the service. Towards the end of the service, Abby Latham made a profession of faith, and we welcomed the Maddox family into our congregation. I went home. I had an awesome Easter lunch with my family. I ate some of my kids' Easter candy. Only the kind, only the kind they wouldn't eat, okay? Don't think so ill of me. I only ate the candy they refused to eat. We spent time together. We walked outside. We walked our pets. It was a beautiful day, wasn't it? You remember? Just a week ago. And then I made the mistake of later on in the day opening up Reuters news service. No, it wasn't even cable news. It wasn't opinion. It was just, just the headlines of what's going on in the world around us. And what did I read? There was an embassy raid in Ecuador. Iran was threatening after an Israeli strike in Syria. Ukraine warned of dwindling air defense missiles. Two planes at Heathrow collided on the ground. There was a near-miss cyber attack on the U.S. And last but not least, the cicadas will be here soon. I think maybe in those moments as I was reading those headlines at the end of the day, I, I, I thought to myself, did this morning even matter? Why speak of resurrection hope with headlines like this? And, and I think it's because I was trying to hang my hat on optimistic thinking. That if these issues aren't taken care of today or by the end of the year, then what is there to hope for, right? Right? truth is, most of those issues in those headlines probably won't be resolved by the end of this month or maybe even by the end of this year. No, Easter Sunday did not wipe out our current struggles. I, I didn't need to open the Reuters webpage to know that there is depression and anxiety and grief and financial stress and work problems and school problems and relationship problems in this world that we continue to face even after Easter Sunday. What I do believe is that the hope of Easter runs much deeper than any kind of optimism I might have today. And it gives us a divinely imparted wisdom and spirit-given power. It's, it instills resurrection hope in our lives that no kind of optimism can fulfill. And that can make a difference. Resurrection means we are not left powerless with no wisdom and nothing to push us forward. With resurrection, we don't merely sit on our hands and hope that some rush of optimism comes over us. With resurrection, we find the resurrected Christ and join him in that work in the world. John Cole says that for the writer of Ephesians, Christ and the church are inseparable, with the church complementing the work of its head. In other words, because God's saving work is not finished, neither is the task to which believers, old and new, have been called as Christ's body. So you'd better believe that the work of Easter is not over with. We need to continue to instill hope in this world. And so how are we going 
to do that. I first encourage you to embrace the power of resurrection hope over and above optimism. Let's make sure we get these terms right. On April 3, 1968, standing before a crowded church, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. painted his vision for justice. He said, I've seen the promised land. Do you know what he said after that? He said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. 22 hours later, he was assassinated. He was not optimistic that he would reach the promised land, yet he was hopeful about the ultimate goal. Make no mistake that our faith in the empty tomb and the resurrection is the greatest source of hope we can take on ourselves and offer to a hurting world. Let's make resurrection hope, not optimism, but resurrection hope central to who we are. I also challenge you to value, cherish, and seek resurrection wisdom. This is not just the accumulation of knowledge over time. This is not just memorizing scripture. This is not just becoming a really good theologian. This is about using your life and your knowledge and your judgment and your experience to see the world through a resurrection lens. Not to deny reality. That's not what Paul or Christ asks of us. But the Spirit does call on us to view the world through a resurrection lens. For we have the hope of resurrection in our hearts, and so we must look for the signs of resurrection all around us. Every time we see acts of compassion, every time we see community being built, every time we see people being, being fed and given something to drink, every time we see reconciliation and redemption, we can remember that the hope of resurrection is alive and it is thriving in our world, as hard as that can be to believe sometimes. And I finally challenge you to believe that resurrection hope has the power to change your life and the community. The theologian A.W. Tozer says, it is the devil's business to keep Christians mourning and weeping with pity instead of demonstrating that Jesus Christ is risen indeed. Let's hear that again. It is the devil's business to keep Christians mourning and weeping with pity instead of demonstrating that Christ is risen, risen indeed. Yes, the cross is the symbol of God's love for us. But if we really say and we really mean that death is defeated, then we'd better proclaim resurrection with our words and with our lives. Reverend Ad Admiral Jim Stockdale said one more thing. He said, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your reality, whatever that might be. I like how the Admiral uses the word discipline. I would expect no less from him. I think in many ways, living out resurrection is a discipline. Most of the time, we're, we're teetering on optimism or pessimism. It kind of just depends on how our day is going, how we're feeling in the moment, what's going on in the world around us think in many ways living as a resurrection people is a kind of discipline, isn't it? It's something we must choose to enter into every day, every moment of our lives. So I encourage you as you continue to celebrate Easter and reflect on the empty tomb that you would take on the discipline of resurrection and that you would live it in real time. Not merely proclaim resurrection as something that will happen someday but that something that Christ is doing in the world around us even today. That is the hope we live by. That is the hope we proclaim. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for resurrection hope. We thank you for reminding us through today's scripture that resurrection is more than just a, a one Sunday a year observance or celebration, but that it is something tra that transcends the entirety of our lives. We pray today that we would take on this discipline of resurrection, 
that we, when we begin to, to, to falter and simply lean into whether we're being optimistic or feeling pessimistic for the day, that we would dig deeper, that we would cling to the hope of resurrection. May we not merely keep this inheritance for ourselves. May we hand it out. May we share it. May we proclaim it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At First Baptist Church, we believe that life's most important decision is to become a follower of Jesus. And if you've never made that decision and wish to do so today or to announce that decision, I invite you to see me at the front as we sing our final hymn. Or if the next step in your Christian journey involves uniting with First Baptist Church and making this your church home, we'd love to welcome you into the warm embrace of this faith community. But no matter where you are in your faith journey, listen to God's Spirit as we stand together to sing hymn 633, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Let's stand together and sing. so much for joining us for worship today at First Baptist Church. And once again, if you are a guest with us, please don't hesitate to stop and say hello on your way out. We would love to get to know you. I told someone I would announce something very special today. And so Regina Hall's nephew it is uh, ne nephew Bentley. Is that right? It's Regina's nep nephew. He is being baptized next week at local church Forsyth. And he wanted to announce that. And I, I want to celebrate that with him. Believe it or not, God is doing a lot of good things in other churches around the world. So I think we should celebrate and remember those too. So he was with us today. I think he stepped out. Uh, but we have a baptism to celebrate uh, at another church family uh, next week. So I'm, I hope that you will pray for Bentley as he begins his uh, walk with Christ. As we jump back into things this week, whether or not you were on spring break or not, um, I pray that you would keep the hope of Christ and the hope of resurrection in your heart as you prepare to go. So as we prepare to go, hear now this benediction, and then we will be dismissed. As you go, remember once again, the tomb is empty and hope abounds. Go sharing this good news with all whom you encounter this week. In Jesus' name we go. Amen. Amen.